topic tonight? Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. A house goes on flame, it's burning. The owner is very sad. He had turned down, had some offers, at least on three occasions. Now the neighbors are watching the scene unfold. They're just on lookers, they have no emotions. He's all alone sad. While he's so disheartened, the firstborn comes, his first son, and says, Dad, I hope you don't mind what I'm going to tell you. Just yesterday, I sold our house at almost three times its market value. The father relaxes. He changes. Now, when he's in that temple of victory, his second son arrives and says, what are you people smiling about? And the man says, no, don't worry. Your brother sold the house yesterday at almost three times the value. And the boy says, I know. But the buyer only made a 5% down payment. The house owner is angry again. He's sad. His countenance sinks. In that situation, the dad's son comes again and says, Dad, don't worry. I've just arrived from seeing the buyer of the house. He's such a gentleman. I've given him the situation on the ground and he said, look, it was not anybody's fault. From the moment I committed my 5%, from the moment we signed the contract, the house is already mine. I'll pay full amount. The countenance of the owner changes immediately. He brightens up. He's excited. He's now just another onlooker watching that property go down in flames. Mark this, the situation on the ground is not changing, only the ownership. Because most of our emotional swings have to do with where our values are. Where our emotional attachments are is where our values are. You see, while the image of God in us has been distorted, damaged, and greatly marred by sin, we still are image bear us. And part of what that means that we are created in the image of God is that we, just like God, have a variety of emotions and we are able to experience the emotions of those around us. That doesn't, however, mean we should illuminate plain old tapes of negative things that have happened in our past. It is normal when your house goes on flames. It is normal when you lose a job and you're just a sole breadwinner. Or maybe your business comes down because of political environment. When a spouse demeans you, when a supervisor looks down upon you, when a dear one is diagonalized with stage four cancer, or even when you lose a loved one, it's very normal for our emotions to sink low. But we've got to be careful that we don't compromise our emotional hygiene. I have personally witnessed, and maybe you have, someone collapse when they were burying their loved one and they follow suit. And maybe you have also seen it. You see, negative emotions limit our possibilities. They dwarf our world. If you're walking in the jungle and you stumble across a wild tiger, while you are an intelligent being, you're very likely to respond just like a an antelope and begin to run away from the tiger. <laughs> Knowing very well, all things being equal, you can't outrun a tiger. Because negative emotions dwarf our perspectives and our worldview. And that's one reason I should tell you tonight, you should not be doing your assignments the last minute because it causes panic. Positive emotions, on the other hand, broaden your possibilities. In 201, a lady by the name Fred Dixon, while conducting a social science research, decided to divide her class into five groups. And she played video clips of different emotions. The first group, she played emotions of happiness. The second group, emotions of excitement. The third group, emotions that were just neutral, neither positive nor negative. The fourth group, emotions of fear. And the last group, group number five, emotions of anger. And then she asked the participants in the various groups to write what they would do in the five different scenarios. Groups four and five had the least responses. Or groups one and two, that one of happiness and excitement, had the highest responses, even much more than the control group, group number three, the neutral group. And she concluded, positive emotions broaden your possibilities. They broaden your worldview. And that's why I'm against a few of you here, I know without a shadow of doubt, have gone to an organization named Withheld, 
where they told you to walk on hot coal, looking to the sky saying, ice cold, ice cold, ice cold. Don't lift up your heart. <laughs> but you know what? Fear breeds more fear. You don't build courage by subjecting yourself to fear. Any banker in our midst will tell you, if they have ever been tell us, they are never trained how to handle counterfeit money. They are taught the genuine money, only then they can identify the counterfeit because we cannot tell the versions, the mutations of counterfeits. It's useless to teach people the counterfeits. So you teach them the genuine bill and they can identify anything that is counterfeit. When we get new believers in church, we take them through the truth. We don't teach them cards and awkwards. Once they get to know the real truth, then they can easily identify what is not true. And one reason why our children should be going out to play is because as they interact with the other kids in their state, in their neighborhood, they begin to develop social skills, which we are going to discuss in details tonight, that have far reaching implications in their personal and professional lives someday. One of the most prolific writers and researchers in emotional intelligence, Daniel Goldman, argues that 67% of your success is explained by emotional intelligence. All other factors like your educational level, your background, your personality, your networking capacity, explain no more than 33%. Contrastingly, we emphasize grades and intelligent quotient, IQ, in our children. And as adults, we focus more on hard work, physical well-being, financial well-being, at the expense of our emotional well-being. I suggest we should emphasize on the latter without compromising the former. If any of you right now in this meeting get some toothache with or without a medical cover, you are likely to walk out on me and fix your tooth problem. But we hardly invest in the more critical pillar of our life, our emotional well-being, the pillar upon which all others hang. You see, our proclivity to emotions is much stronger than to logic. If you've got to win in this life, you've got to connect with people both at the heart level and at the head level. I think at this early stage, allow me to draw a line between three terms that we confuse with emotional intelligence. We often confuse the word temperament, personality, and IQ, intelligent quotient, with emotional intelligence. Now, temperament is your natural disposition. Personality combines temperament with experience to form long life traits. IQ, on the other hand, is your learning ability, the speed at which you grasp issues. Now, these three, temperament, personality, and IQ, are static. They are constant through your life. I know there's a lot of confusion. A lot of people think IQ changes with the information you acquire. No, you have the same IQ you had when you are in primary school. And maybe one of the days I'll be teaching about IQ. I'll dig into details. Now, the good news tonight is that emotional intelligence is elastic. It can grow. You can learn. You can develop it. It's not static. You can deliberately grow in the area of emotional intelligence. But if you don't know your deepest beliefs and convictions and values and concerns, then you cannot see it in others. You cannot accurately see in others what you cannot see in yourself. You can only understand in others what you understand in yourself. It takes a successful person to see success from a distance and to recognize and appreciate what it takes to succeed. It takes a great leader to sense leadership from a distance and to respect leadership. It takes a great speaker to identify a great message. If I know my insecurities, I can see it in others. If I know my worries, I can see it in others. If I know my struggles, I can see it in others. If I know my shame, I can see it in others. If I know my weaknesses, I can see it in others. At the same time, if I know how to recognize my power, then I can recognize it in others. If I know my potential, I can recognize it when I see it in others. If I know my purpose, I can recognize it when I see it in others. If I know my worth, 
I can recognize it when I see it in you. If I know my legacy, I can recognize it if I just spend a moment with you. This truth is the foundation of emotional intelligence. If you don't know what car you're driving, you cannot tell which cars others are driving. You can only accurately tell what you personally understand. You see, one of the greatest deceptions is that we live in the same world. We don't. Your own upbringing and experiences form your worldview. Emotional intelligence will help you appreciate that your worldview, your perspective, is not the only reality. I don't know the world you live in. I live in a world of love. I live in a world of concern. I live in a world of interdependence. I live in a world of teamwork. I live in a world of courtesy, where in my world, we have the words, please, excuse me, thank you, sorry, forgive me. You see, a loving person lives in a loving world. A hostile person lives in a hostile world. The ability to shape your world in ways that serve you the best may be the most important lesson you'll ever learn. The ability to recognize that the only thing you can control in this universe is yourself may be the most vital lesson you'll ever learn. Because then you will focus on the only thing you can control, and that is yourself. As long as you think you're green, you will grow. So long as you think you're ripe, you will rot. Often than not, what we know prevents us from what we could know. It blocks us from what we need to know. So I invite you today to offset your weaknesses by leveraging on your strengths. I'll discuss tonight some five pillars of emotional intelligence. And the first one is self-awareness. Number two, self-regulation. Number three, motivation. Number four, empathy. And number five, social intelligence. Are you glad you came? Yes. You're too serious. <laughs> All right, number one, self-awareness. Cultivate self-awareness. Experience yourself. Know thyself. Now, staying strong in the face of adversity is an undeniable trait, an indisputable asset in this life. But I urge us tonight to be wary of our physiological and psychological needs, to listen to the subtle cues that our mind is setting, the signals being communicated from our brain. Frightful stubbornness, just to stay afloat for the sake of it, ignoring self-awareness may make you prone to massive stress fractures and emotional gracious. Now, I would like you to, to watch me for a moment. And thank goodness they gave me some water if it gets hot. I have a glass here. How, how heavy is this water? Someone, good physicists, have that iced tea in our midst? How many grams? Yeah, any good estimate? I think you should be able to estimate. Don't you know the weight of this? I'm not tricking you, don't you know? So, <laughs> what is the weight? About 250 grams. <coughs> Honestly, the weight doesn't matter. If I hold this glass of water, for a minute, that's all right. If I hold it at arm's length for an hour, I'll have a neck. If I hold it at arm's length for a day, 24 hours nonstop, you might call an appearance for me. It's not the weight. It's how long I hold my burdens. Learn to keep your burdens down. Don't underestimate. You might be thinking the burdens in my heart are so light. Refuse to run your life on autopilot. Refuse to go through vicious cycles, recurrent patterns, playing the same game year in, year out. Refuse to be in a relationship that is headed nowhere. Refuse to be in a job that tears you emotionally. Have the guts, have the courage to step out and implement your business idea. Staying small for too long will lead you to a state of despair. 
begin to see the dissatisfaction as a gift. Yes, you had it right. I mean a gift. A gift of self-awareness. A gift to reinvent yourself, to rediscover who you are. Caution. Even as you listen to these statements, be very sure that you have analyzed why things are not working for you before you blame your boss, before you blame your partner, before you blame your spouse. Self-awareness causes you to do a critical analysis of your own responsibility into what is happening in your life. I urge you, do not at all after this meeting blame your spouse for a marriage going to the doldrums. What is my role in all this? Blame games are the excuses. It's an indication of someone with low self-awareness. If people are being promoted in that place of work, stop blaming nepotism and tribalism. And ask yourself, what is my role in all this stuff? In business, stop blaming corruption. Stop blaming the choice of the industry. There's someone succeeding, same business side by side. Cultivate self-acceptance. Setting your own goals, not setting goals of other people to impress the restaurant's audience around you. At the same time, not setting important goals that don't inspire growth, but setting goals that stretch you beyond your previous self. Self-awareness will enhance your self-esteem and self-confidence. The lower the self-esteem, the higher the need to impress. The lower the self-awareness, the more one causes and the less sensitive they are with their own behavior. The higher the self-confidence, the less the need to prove your self-worth. I urge you tonight, check your default response to life's tricky seasons. What's your default response? Are you defensive? And if so, what are you defending? Are you a control freak? And if so, what does that prevent you from dealing with? Are you a serial liar? And if so, what are you hiding? Do you keep suffering from frequent, unstable mood swings? And if so, how does that profit you? Is your life full of excuses? And if so, what does that make you avoid to address? You see, we learn self-awareness the same way we learn dancing. You learn dancing by being attentive to your own body movements. We don't learn self-awareness from books. Books will give you intellectual knowledge, conceptual understanding, which doesn't necessarily amount to self-awareness. You learn self-awareness by being attentive to your thought system and your behavior patterns. The more you enhance your self-awareness, the more you begin to notice patterns in your life and behaviors and habits that you're not conscious about in your past. You stop lying to yourself. You begin to detect triggers to your emotions. And you change behavior before steam builds up. See, self-awareness is all about your own awareness of your thought system and behavior patterns. And being able to control these emotions before they build steam. Failure to enhance your self-awareness may lead to many things, headaches, migraines, depression, even stroke and heart attack. Suicidal tendencies. Emotions are contagious. Think of these side effects of lack of self-awareness and imagine yourself pouring such vitro into your child, into your spouse, into your colleague at work, into your neighbor, into a customer approaching your shop, and now realize how much people start rejecting you. Yes, we are emotional beings. But we've got to use our emotions constructively in ways that help us move forward. Life is a paradox. To deny this natural law is a fool's game. There's a time to attach and a time to detach. There is a time to accept and a time to reject. There is a time to build and a time to demolish. It's a time to embrace and a time to let go. It's a time to know you are enough and a time to know that more is possible. There's a time to learn like you're doing right now and there's a time to act. There's a time to listen to someone else 
and a time to listen to yourself. There is a time to move and a time to settle down. Self-awareness helps you to see the paradox and not leave either side blindly. So when you have self-awareness, it's like you have a program within your mind that auto-corrects. You self-correct because you're self-aware. Without self-awareness, you have the universe against you. Whatever success means to you, the odds are enhanced once you're self-aware. The odds are enhanced because you have insight. The odds are enhanced because you have perspective. The odds are enhanced because you have clarity. See, the people who spend an entire life pursuing other people's dreams, not their own dreams. Self-awareness is the key to mastering your life. In self-awareness, that's where your freedom is found. In self-awareness, that's where your power is found. Are you willing tonight to grab the reins of self-awareness and take your world by storm rather than become a puppet life for manipulation? And this takes me to the second pillar of emotional intelligence, self-regulation. Are we learning something? Yes. Are you sure? Well, self-awareness is a, being aware of emotions. Regulation is managing your emotions. It's the management of your emotions. I'm going to discuss two extreme emotions, anger and happiness. In between, I'll discuss about forgiveness. Let, let's just look at anger. And a 10-year-old boy used to lose his temper too much. And the father wanted to help the boy get out of his anger situation. So he called the boy and took him to his bedroom and said, look, the next time you lose your temper, I want you to hammer a nail right in your beautiful photo gallery wall. That particular day, he hammered 11 nails. As the days progressed, he realized it was easier to control his temper than to hammer the nails. Eventually, many days passed, over hard nails had gone into his photo gallery wall. He went to the father and said, Dad, I have money to stop losing my temper. The father said, look, for every single successful day that you don't lose your temper, I want you to pull out just one nail. Days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months. Eventually, the day came when all the nails were removed, and the boy had already overcome his temper problem. The father held him by the head, took him to the photo gallery wall and said, I want us to learn a lesson. Look closely. Your photo gallery wall will never be the same again. It is damaged beyond repair. You can stab a man with a knife and pull it out and apologize, but the scar is still there. There are some things we do and say in life, you can never call them back. You see, anger is an undesired emotion that we try to repress, suppress, and subdue. According to some estimates, a married couple suffers anger on the minimum side eight to ten times a day, and that's when before they have children. <laughs> <laughs> anger is a secondary emotion, usually a reaction to a primary emotion like frustration or pain or disappointment. The most natural response to pain is anger. Anger is sending a signal to you that something isn't right. We are hurting. Something needs to be fixed. Our rights are being violated. Our needs or wants are not adequately being met. Or our very being, our personal space, our goals, our ambitions, our values are being compromised in a given relationship. Or simply, we are doing too much than we are comfortable, or giving too much time than we can comfortably give, or even other resources than we can comfortably give. Or sometimes, Someone is doing too much for us at the expense of our own growth. Anger is not just an uncomfortable emotion that each one of you has suffered, but a potentially dangerous emotion. A recent survey in the United States indicated that over 70% of all murder victims, sorry, uh, yeah, victims, guys incarcerated in prison on account of murder, that was their first crime. They had no criminal record. 60% of all homicide cases were committed by someone who knew the victim. A hundred of the interviewees incarcerated in prison were not angry people, but professionals of good standing. 
entrepreneurs of good repute, who had stuffed up emotions over the years, and at some point, they couldn't take it anymore. They acted violently, leading to murder. Why should we control anger? First, anger compromises your own health. Anger is known to cause headaches and migraines, digestive problems, insomnia, high blood pressure, stroke, and heart attack. In fact, I was reading an article that was summarizing 44 studies in the Journal of American College of Cardiology that drew a direct correlation between anger and hostility and heart problems. The father suggested for those who are healthy, they become more prone to heart problems. And for those who have already been diagnosed with heart problems, the odds of suffering stroke or heart attack is enormously enhanced. Needless to tell you, Ega makes you look older and uglier. <laughs> A smiley face makes you look fresh, jovial and younger. There is not a single relationship, no matter how strong it is, that can withstand endless assault by anger. Eventually it will budge. Anger makes us say or do irrational things, make decisions that are irrecoverable. Let me suggest something. The next moment you feel like losing it in a boardroom, the next moment you feel like throwing a pan to your spouse, the next moment you feel like hitting a matatu to teach him a lesson. Count one to ten, for heaven's sake. <laughs> Up to ten. If it doesn't work, get out of the situation. Take a walk. Get back. Journal your feelings just as you feel it. Don't censor what you're feeling. Everything you wanted to tell that person. You see, most of us want to tell the other person a piece of our mind. Not realizing you're risking having our own peace of mind. So just write what you're feeling. Everything, everything. Write it down, write it down. No matter how many pages they are. If you wanted to call him names of all domestic animals, write it down. <laughs> write it down. Just write it down. <laughs> now, once your steams come down, for some of you it will take hours, for some of you it will take days, for some of you it will take weeks. But once your steams come down, go back to your laptop to the folder you had hidden that stuff and delete it. Don't keep a record of wrongs. Does that make sense? One sure way of dealing with anger is forgiveness. To all is to, is to human. As to forgive is divine. A marriage is a union of two forgivers. For that matter, any single healthy relationship is promised on forgiveness. You know, strictly speaking, forgiveness is a very selfish act because of the immense benefit that it does to the person who forgives. A life lived without forgiveness is a life lived in the past. Forgiveness does not in any way change your past, but it does open your future. That's why forgiveness is the sweetest revenge. Forgive every time. But if you always find yourself on the forgiving side, you might want to take a closer look on the game you're playing with the person who sets you up always to be angry. Forgiveness does not mean allowing the offender to walk away scot-free. That naivety turns the offender into the victim. The offended into the victim, sorry and encourages a recurrence of the offense. We can and we should hold people accountable for actions committed or omitted. Forgiveness means transferring the right of vengeance to God, allowing God to take care of justice. Now, forgiveness is not the same as reconciling. You can forgive someone even if you never get along with them again. Why should you forgive such people? You see, forgiveness is not for the weak. Forgiveness is a virtue of the brave. You forgive them because the beginning of emotional healing, the foundation of emotional healing 
is forgiveness. You don't know how to tell someone that you forgive them. Self-righteously announcing your gracious acts of forgiveness to someone who did not even ask you <laughs> to make them feel guilty. Forgiveness is a process. Admittedly, it might take a long time, especially after a tragic divorce. It may not happen immediately. But the earlier you forgive, the better. Forgiving early sets you free from pain and from focusing on the person you think offended you. You see, forgiveness has nothing to do with the other party. Forgiveness is an attitude. An attitude of the heart. Informed by the fact that in this life, there will always be offenses. Always. Always. It is realizing that and deciding you're not going to sink to that game. It's a decision you make on your part because you'll always be offended in this life. You choose to forgive. It has nothing to do, I repeat, with the other party. You forgive and you forget. Forgetting doesn't mean ignoring ground reality or exposing yourself to open abuse. Forgetting, however, does mean knowing that some people will never change, so you need to change the way you deal with them and quit expecting them to change. So forgive and forget. If you can't do both, at least pick one. <laughs> Agreed? Yes. And this takes me to happiness. <coughs> I read of a story of an elderly lady who was a legally bride, and on the first day when she went into a retirement home, she found this young, beautiful lady who received her at the reception in a very cordial, in a very warm way. And the young lady told the elderly woman, I'm going to go and make your room and then come back for you. Please just wait for me for a few moments. The elder woman replied, I love it. And the young lady said, how do you 